In the 1947 novel, The Plague, Albert Camus tells the story of a virus spreading uncontrollably through a small city on the Algerian coast. For a year, the citizens are locked down and cut off from the rest of the world as the epidemic claims tens of thousands of lives. The pestilence brings death and it brings unremitting uncertainty. The same kind of uncertainty lies at the heart of the central question I want to explore today. How do people make personal sense of a crisis? With our current crisis in mind, how do we understand our own lives in the context of a pandemic? As a starting point, let me suggest one simple answer. We understand crises in the same way we understand our lives more generally through stories. People make meaning of life through life narrative. As a personality and developmental psychologist, I have spent three decades exploring the idea of narrative identity, which I define as the story in your mind about how you came to be and where your life may be going. Nearly all of us are walking around with stories in our heads that link up our personal pasts as we can reconstruct them with our imagined futures. These stories, shaped by personal experience and by culture, provide our lives with some sense of meaning and purpose. I would like to consider three different ways we might make narrative sense of our lives in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. These are, at the same time, three kinds of stories for comprehending the meaning of the virus itself and its place in history. I will refer to the three as one, the episodic approach, two, narratives of redemption, and three, radical acceptance. For the first approach, I have been obsessed with what I believe to be a very strange case of a highly successful late midlife man who seems nearly bereft or devoid of a narrative identity. He does not have in his head a story about how he came to be, who he is, and where his life is going. He has a few personal memories, no doubt about that, and he has life goals. But this person refuses to make any larger meaning out of the moments that comprise his life. I see him as the quintessential episodic man. Maybe you know who I'm talking about. In the strange case of Donald J. Trump, I adopt an evidence-based psychological science approach to make sense of this very strange man's life and his personality. From dispositional personality traits to authoritarian proclivities to his all-encompassing narcissism, the conventional ideas that psychological science has to offer in explaining Mr. Trump can take you only so far. Even in concert, they fail to capture his deep and abiding psychological strangeness. It is as if each of these noteworthy features of Mr. Trump's psychological makeup revolves around an empty core, like a vortex. In the middle of the vortex, where the story should be but never was, is a narrative vacuum. He has no story in his mind about who he is and how he came to be. No story of change and development. He simply is and has always been fully formed Trump, a stable genius, as if sprung full form from the head of Zeus. That is how he sees himself. He does nonetheless have a philosophy of life, as told in an interview with People Magazine almost 40 years ago, and here it is. Man is the most vicious of all animals, Trump said, and life is a series of battles ending in victory or defeat. What he means is that each battle itself ends in victory or defeat, one after another. The key thing is to win the battle that you are in right now, today, in the current episode, and then move on to the next. Mr. Trump is famously not introspective, retrospective, or prospective. There is no depth. There is no past. There is very little by way of a projected future. 
Part of what makes him so appealing to millions of Americans, even as it repulses millions more, is that he is all here now in the moment. What you see is pretty much what you get. Authentic, primal, unexpurgated Trumpness, oblivious to norms and social conventions, outside of time and history, repeatedly playing the one role that he has played again and again and again, going back to his early adult years as a real estate developer. It has always been Donald Trump playing Donald Trump. The shtick is the man in the moment, fighting to win the moment, moment by moment, episode by episode. How does the episodic man make sense of the coronavirus? It is a big challenge for him because the virus, it's part of a long-term story. And Trump, he lives in the current moment. On March 11, the president characterized the problem of the virus is confined to a temporary moment in time. Two weeks before then, he predicted that the virus would be here today, gone tomorrow. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. On certain days in January and February of this year, he denied that the virus even existed. It was all a plot hatched by his enemies to bring down his presidency. On other days, he conceded that there was a virus but that the United States was uniquely safe, as if the nation existed outside the bounds of time and space. Moving through his presidency, moment by discrete moment, each moment separated from what came before and what may follow, fighting to win each moment in time, Donald Trump will say whatever it takes to win what he perceives to be the battle of the moment. One day, he will urge Americans to rise up against their state's governors and force businesses to reopen. The very next day, he will criticize a state's governor for doing exactly what he told the protesters to do the day before. If it feels right to him in the moment, he will claim that an unproven drug is a miracle cure for COVID-19. Or he will entertain the idea that sick people might be injected with bleach as he did on April 23rd. Because he lives outside the narrative flow of time, you cannot predict what the episodic man will do in any given moment, but you can predict what he will not do. He will not be able to articulate a long-term plan to address the problem. He will not be able to formulate a plausible narrative that extends back into the past and forward into the distant future to explain what has happened and what we might do step by step to alter the plot and move the story in a better direction, to flatten the curve, as it were, to arrive at something that looks like a better place than where we are right now after a long and difficult journey. The episodic man cannot create the kind of story for himself, that kind of story, or that kind of story for the world. Instead, he thinks about the situation the way many of the citizens in the Algerian town thought about the plague in its early days. Camus writes of sensing a void within which never left us, that irrational longing to hark back to the past or else speed up the march of time. In other words, let us magically make the present moment like it was yesterday. And let us fast forward through the next part of the movie to get to an episode we might like, way off in the future. In sum, the episodic man traffics in denial and magical thinking. We will wake up tomorrow and the virus will be gone, he believes. That is about as far as he can go with such a depleted narrative sensibility. To the extent then that Mr. Trump can create a narrative that anticipates the long term, the story may sound like this. The virus will go away. I know it will. And then we will get back to where we were. We will be great again. Let us move on to redemption, my second story form. In the fields of clinical psychology and the helping professions in psychological science, which is where I mainly hang out, and in the popular press, 
there exists uh, a huge literature on how many how people try to make narrative sense of bad things that happen in their lives. For example, clinical psychologists have documented a phenomenon they call post-traumatic growth. Survivors of combat, natural disasters, physical abuse, and other traumatic experiences sometimes report later that they gained an unexpected benefit from the horrific event. Without downplaying the suffering, they may report that their negative experience gave them a new insight about their lives or taught them to cherish life more or brought them closer to the people they love or closer to God. They feel that they experience some form of personal growth as a result of the trauma. Suffering can often improve us, the research suggests. As inspiration for their approach, two leading researchers in this area of post-traumatic growth quote the Christian New Testament. In Romans 5, 5, the Apostle Paul writes, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Research consistently suggests that people often strive to make positive meaning out of negative events, little ones and big ones. They aim to formulate redemptive narratives, that is stories wherein suffering leads ultimately to enhancement. The research also suggests that people who are more or less successful in creating redemptive stories in the wake of negative events tend to enjoy higher levels of mental health and psychological well-being. The finding seems to hold even when the negative events are national in scope. Jonathan Adler and Michael Poulin found that Americans who derived redemptive meanings from the 9-11 attacks in the months immediately following those attacks, tended to show higher scores on psychological well-being later on, compared to those Americans whose stories of 9-11 lacked clear, positive resolutions. My own research in this area has focused on the life stories told by highly generative midlife American adults. As described by the great psychoanalytic theorist Eric Erickson, to be generative in midlife is to commit yourself to the well-being and development of future generations. Parenting is the essential arena wherein generativity is expressed, but generativity is also expressed just as strongly in teaching, mentoring, civic engagement, leadership, and a range of other behaviors and commitments aimed at leaving a positive legacy of the self for future generations. My research question in this line is this, how do highly generative adults narrate their lives? The basic design of the research is that we interview people who differ from each other with respect to how, generativity, how generative they are, who appear to be on measures, and then we compare their life stories to each other. The general finding from many studies is that highly generative adults are more likely than their less generative counterparts to construct redemptive stories to make sense of their lives. Their stories converge on a general narrative form that I call the redemptive self. The redemptive self is made up of five themes pictured here. One, the protagonist of the story enjoys an early advantage or blessing in her or his life. Two, at the same time, the protagonist becomes aware of the suffering of other people or maybe of basic injustices and inequities in the world. The story ex implicitly expresses a dynamic with these two themes. It's saying, I am blessed, I'm fortunate, but others suffer. Or put differently, I am the gifted hero who journeys forth into a dangerous world. Three, the protagonist develops clear and abiding principles to guide behavior typically rooted in religious or social ideologies, a theme I label moral depth and steadfastness. Four, bad things happen in the story, as they do in all stories, but good things often follow, the basic idea of redemption. And five, the protagonist envisions a positive pro-social future, wherein she or he is able to continue to make positive contributions to others. Redemptive stories, affirm hope and a commitment 
to making the world a better place. Creating a narrative identity that features many scenes wherein bad things lead to good outcomes may sustain the optimism and the faith we need to persevere in the face of adversity. The juxtaposition of the theme's early advantage and the suffering of others, that sense that I am special and that the world needs me, that may motivate pro-social behavior and provide a narrative frame or even a kind of life justification for making sense of altruism and civic responsibility. There is often a sense of gratitude in stories like these, as told by highly generative American adults. They're saying, I've been fortunate in my life and I need to give back. It is easy to see how redemptive narratives might help people make sense of and to cope with the current crisis. We will get through this, the story says. There will be tremendous suffering, yes, but in the long run, we will emerge stronger for what we went through. In a New York Times column dated March 26, David Brooks expresses the hope that Americans will find long-term redemptive meaning in the virus. I quote him here. We will look back on this as one of the most meaningful periods of our lives, Brooks writes. Our long-term well-being depends on the story we tell about the moment. It's the way we tie our moment of suffering to a larger narrative of redemption. It's the way we then go out and stubbornly live out the story. The play today is an invisible monster, but it gives birth to a better world. Well, not a day goes by on social media, on television, in the newspapers, without the proliferation of redemptive stories about the coronavirus. And some of these are really dramatic stories of recovery, starring nurses and first responders who minister to the victims, and starring those victims themselves, of course, who after weeks on a respirator, say, managed to come back from the precipice. Others are narratives that find unexpected benefits in the shutdowns. Families are eating dinners together now, for example. The skies are much less polluted. People are finding a new sense of community in being alone together. In the United States, those with a progressive political persuasion may imagine that the crisis will ultimately usher in universal health care or a green, Neal, a green New Deal or other positive social policies, uh, they invoke the story of America's overcoming the adversity of the Great Depression and World War II in the 1930s and 40s to emerge as a stronger and more egalitarian society. On April 29, the New Zealand-born poet pictured here, Thomas Roberts, aka Tom Foolery, uploaded a video to YouTube that, that tells the most redemptive story of the virus that I have yet encountered. It's a young father in the story. He's, he's telling his son a bedtime tale, and it's entitled The Great Realization. It starts out like this. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's 2020. Set off in an idyllic post-COVID future, the story looks back in hindsight to a dystopian era, that is, the years immediately before 2020, when the world was starkly divided between the rich and the poor, when people lost themselves in their smartphones as the planet burned. The four-minute video suggests that we must have gotten through it all, traveled the long redemptive passage to a better world. Still, when the story ends, the little boy wants to know, well, why did it take a virus to bring the people together? It's a great question. In Camus, The Plague, it is not clear to me that the pathogen did bring the people together. After months and months of mounting deaths, the narrator remarks that the Algerian citizens were living without memories without hope. There is no denying that the plague had gradually killed off in all of us the faculty, not of love only, but even of friendship. Thankfully, the citizens do get through it all, the survivors, that is, and there is something like a happy ending to this story. 
almost a year into the epidemic, the pathogen seems to change its mind. Perhaps there is a mutation in its genetic code. For whatever reason, victims begin to recover. A young girl lying in a hospital bed, her prognosis seemed to be hopeless, she suddenly revives. The night before, she was delirious and had all the symptoms of mnemonic plague, but the next morning, her temperature had fallen. She's now in the clear. The doctors observed that her recovery went against all the rules. The plague, it subsides. It just, well, it goes away. The city finally opens up and the citizens rejoice. They are deliriously happy. The story's narrator, however, cautions against a purely redemptive interpretation for the plague. The tale could not be one of a final victory, the narrator says. It could be only the record of what had had to be done and what assuredly would have to be done again in the never-ending fight against terror and its relentless onslaughts. Despite the personal afflictions by all who, while unable to be saints, but refusing to bow down to pestilences, strive their utmost to be healers. The central protagonist in the plague is Dr. Benjamin Liu. He is, we must assume, the model for the healer in stories of this kind. Along with a small group of friends and associates, Dr. Liu ministers to the sick and dying during the many months when the pestilence ravages the city. He puts in 18-hour days, moving back and forth between hospital wards and victims' homes. It is grueling work. Yet Ryu insists that he is not a hero. There is no question of heroism in all of this, he tells a friend. It's a matter of common decency. That's an idea that may make people smile, Ryu confesses, but the only means of fighting a plague is common decency. His friend asks him, well, what does that even mean? What is common decency? Ryu says, I don't know what it means for other people, but in my case, I know that it consists in doing my job. Ever since it was published in 1947, many readers of this masterpiece point to the passage I just read to you as the key to understanding Camus' fundamental message. This is not a heartwarming story of redemption. The plague is not centrally about a gifted, morally steadfast hero, Allah the Redemptor Self, who sets off on a journey to transform the world. Instead, the hero is merely doing his job. Now granted, it is a very hard job and a noble one. Still, if we see his job as healing, then we have to admit that Dr. Yu was mainly a failure. Camus documents very few, if any, instances in which Dr. Ryu actually saves a life. He doesn't really heal anybody, as far as I could tell in my reading of the plague. Having said that, Ryu is an extraordinarily admirable character. And there is something about the overall story told, even if it is not 100% redemptive, that rings of compelling authenticity, something clear-sighted and deeply humane. What is the story being told here? I don't have a good label for this kind of narrative, but it seems to involve, as I see it, a radical acceptance of the world as it is, coupled with the valiant effort to manage the uncertainty of the world. When I say radical acceptance, I don't mean blind conformity, I don't mean resignation, I don't mean selling out and giving up and going on blithely, going along with the status quo. On the pestilence, Dr. Ryu observes, and I quote him here, I know it's an absurd situation, but we're all involved in it and we've got to accept it as it is. When one friend observes that the plague confronts the medical establishment, with one defeat after another, Ryu says, yes, I know that, but it's no reason for giving up the struggle. 
theory and research on the psychological value of acceptance features prominently in the literature on adult development and aging. For example, Eric Erickson identified ego integrity versus despair as the prime psychosocial challenge of the later years in life as strivings for generativity begin to recede somewhat. According to Erickson, ego integrity involves a graceful acceptance of one's very life, whereas despair entails bitterness, rejection, and extensive regret. In my lab, Holland Reicher has shown that midlife adults who score high on self-report measures of ego integrity tend to articulate life stories that renounce regret and display a good deal of what she calls self-transcendence. In lifespan developmental psychology, different conceptions of wisdom converge on the idea that to be wise is in part to transcend egoistic strivings of the self in order to operate effectively in an ambiguous world wherein human beings face implacable limitations in what they can do and know. Therefore, Wisdom entails intellectual humility, awareness of context, perspective flexibility, and the recognition of uncertainty and uncontrollable change in the world. To be wise is to accept gracefully and manage effectively the inherent uncertainty of human affairs. In a recent study of adults ranging in age from 26 to 92 years, the developmental psychologists Nick Westrate and Judith Gluck found that wisdom was positively associated with a tendency to explore the nuances of difficult life experiences. Rather than try to change life, wisdom lay in accepting it as something given. Indeed, accepting suffering as part and parcel of being human, as if suffering itself were like an object an external object prompting reflection and examination. By contrast, the tendency to find redemptive meanings in difficult life experiences was unrelated to wisdom. Building a life narrative around the idea of radical acceptance might work off of the following simple template shown in this slide. The story's setting is a world of uncertainty, unpredictable change, and serendipity. Life in the time of COVID-19, you might say. The idealized goal in the story is to come to terms with life, reconcile conflicts so as to minimize regret, to manage adversity because adversity cannot always be overcome, and to sustain bonds of intimacy and warmth. What kind of protagonist flourishes in a story like this? Well, Dr. Yu, for sure, with those personal characteristics of grace, humility, and flexibility. Seven pages from the end of the novel, Camus gives us the big reveal. He tells us that the narrator of this story all along has been Dr. Ryu himself. Now, we thought, I thought Ryu was the healer, but he is more than that. His paramount role throughout the novel turns out not to have been treating the sick and dying during a time of plague. He did that of course. But more than that, Dr. Yu, as narrator, bears witness to the plague. In his own words, his primary job, the job that required such a wealth of common decency, was to be an honest witness. Camus writes, Dr. Yu resolved to compile this chronicle so that he should not be one of those who hold their peace but should bear witness in favor of those plague-stricken people so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure. And to state quite simply what we learn in a time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men than to despise. In sum, the episodic approach to life in the time of the coronavirus is to deny reality and hope for a magic return to what was. The redemptive approach anticipates that positive meanings will ultimately redeem our suffering. Dr. Yu's message as narrator and protagonist of a story of radical acceptance is not quite as purely optimistic 
as the message of redemption, still, the story sustains hope. The story says that we must bear witness to the suffering of our fellow humans. We have to accept the suffering. We cannot look away. We have to be clear-eyed. Whether or not we're able to overcome adversity in our lives, and we should try to do so, we also have to learn to manage it and to accept the fact that it is likely to be with us always in one form or another. We have to come to terms with the world as it is and to human beings as they are, rather than how we wish the world and people were. In the last sentences of the plague, Dr. Yu tells us that the city is now filled with joy. Everybody is rejoicing. The plague is gone. This is so good. And Dr. Ryu celebrates with his fellow citizens. But Ryu knows something that maybe they don't know or don't know enough. And that is that the joy they are all feeling right now, it will be imperiled again. That is the story of life in Ryu's narrating mind at the end of the time of the plague. Dr. Ryu wants us to know that the very same human story might apply across the board in every time and every place.